Our next training session, which is going to be in Adobe Premiere Pro, um, which is a more advanced editing software, which all of these computers have, which is really amazing. Um, then we'll have another quick we'll have another quick coffee break with more cake, if necessary, before we hand over to you guys. And you can and what you're going to do is choose which of the editing uh, softwares you want to use, we Video or Premiere, to edit a video. And so we have cr we have created some training footage for you and Matt will be showing you some of that footage um, when he does his trainings and you're going to use that footage to try and edit something and you've only got an hour and a half but you know what in news that's all you have anyway that's what a normal person would have an hour and a half but it doesn't matter what stage you get to in your edit we're going to export them at the end um, and make little video files and then we're going to watch them um, with more cake <laughs> I hope there's enough cake Matt <laughs> So if the cake's not good, blame Matt, because he's the one who bought them. So, is everyone okay with that? Yeah? Any questions? Have I skipped something? Not said anything? No, all right then. Let's start. What is post-production? So, um, basically, I'm calling it that because my aim is to answer that question. Because talking to a few people, I realise that some people don't even know what, don't know what post-production is. Um, so we'll talk about that. What's that? Go away, Glinda University. There you go. Um, now, I, as I said, I'm Lizzie. Um, I've been involved in, in media for uh, nearly 15 years now, doing things on and off, bits and bobs. Um, I've worked on a newspaper. I've worked on, in the TV station on news. Um, I've done documentary work. I've done video work. I was a video producer for Greenpeace. And most of this experience was in China. Um, and I moved away from... I moved back here to the UK about two, two and a half years ago and was working as a freelance editor and production manager, which is a horrible job, um, in Bristol. And I only moved to Aberystwyth about six months ago to take up this job as educational media producer. So I've got a bit of background in all of this stuff and editing is, and post-production is my main, uh, one of my main focuses. They call me a predator, which is a, produ a producer editor, <laughs> which I think is quite fun. Anyway. Um, so that's a bit about myself so that you know what's going on. Ooh, wait a minute. Um, yeah, so what is post-production? That's what I want to ask you guys. We're going to start by doing a little bit of brainstorming and um, working out what you think post-production is. Who's going to start us off? Mikey? <laughs> Can I use it? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, hopefully the post-production process is not going to look like this for you guys. You're not going to be sleeping in your editing suite. <laughs> I do all the time, not really. Do these work? No. How are you supposed to use? Have we got any pens? No pens, doesn't matter. We'll just wing it. Um, everything in that picture. Stitching it all together. Stitching it all together, yeah? Stitching it all together. What do you mean? Well, you've got, a number, you've got, say, five, six hours of footage where you need to, to actually edit that to get it to something that means something to the viewer. Exactly. So taking the footage that you filmed and turning it into something that you can actually watch. Yep. Yeah? Yeah, basically it is, it is what you do after filming. That's why it's called post-production, after production, which is filming. Um, and it's got several different steps. Um, several different things that you do. It's not just putting things together. What other things would you be doing in post-production? Adding sound. Adding sound, yeah. That would, I think, be included in putting things together, but yeah, adding sound. Effects and transitions. Yep, effects and transitions. This is all editing. Voice Yep, editing again. Th yeah, I think that a lot of people think that post-production is just editing, um, but it's, it's more than that. Um, distribution. Distribution, I would include, yeah. Distribution, yeah. Titles. Yeah. Acknowledgements. Titles and acknowledgements, like credits. Mm. Yes. That's an important aspect of, of post production. If you're using anything that you didn't make yourself, you have to take care of copyright. And that's something a, a producer would do. Like, that would be my role if I was looking after 
post-production as a producer, looking after the copyright. Um, what about organising your footage, looking after your footage? That's not editing, but it's a really important part of, of post-production because if you don't look after your footage and you can't edit it. Um, yes, dealing with copyright and things like that. I haven't got, got to grips with this thing yet, have I? Um, nope, still haven't got to grips with it. <laughs> I'll get there in the end. And when you've edited, obviously you need to export and then you need to distribute. Yeah, so basically we've got a, a good picture of what post-production is. It isn't just editing. It's looking after all the other things around the edit as well. Um, but what makes a good edit? What do you think makes a good edit? And by edit, I mean a good video, how it's put together well. What, what, what's good about that? Oh, great. Too late in the day, but anyway, thanks, Russ. There's a story to it. Story. Let's just put that at the top. I like that. OK. Yeah, a good edit has a story to it. That's a really good thing to start with. Knowing what to put in and leave out. Yes. Put in and leave out. What do you think you should leave out? And what do you think you should put in? Probably leave out more than you think. <laughs> yes. That is a good point. That's a very good point. Um, anything else? Visually appealing, not just a talking head. Visually appealing. Very good, yeah. But what is visually appealing? <laughs> Action. You went to my last workshop. <laughs> <laughs> Seamless. So it's Seamless. That is a good edit. Seamless. Mm -hmm. I think I don't think any of you need to come to this workshop. <laughs> Anything On else? On theme. On theme. Mm -hmm. Yes. What does that mean? For me, it would mean that you don't shoot off too many tangents or explore avenues of a topic that aren't pertinent to the actual title or the story. Yeah. Yeah. You keep to the story. Yeah, we talk about that. That's keeping to the story as well. So you've got your, you've got your, um, what would the word be? Boundaries. Yeah, your plan, your plan, or your, you've got your script in mind, haven't you? Your purpose. Yeah. Message, which is part related to that purpose, uh, yeah. so it sets a clear idea of So, all you guys are thinking about is it, you're thinking about story apart from the uh, that it's it's seem it's uh, seamless, which is very good. Story should be your focus. So um, the audio has to be good, that is also part of making it seamless. So, audio is really important, it has to be seamless audio. Meaningful to the audience, so it's not full of jargon. Hmm, yeah. Meaningful. No jargon. What about providing what you've been commissioned to provide? Yeah, I think so. Staying on purpose. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So commission. The person who's paying the money. Yeah. Well, I think we're all going to have to do it for free here. <laughs> <laughs> this keeps coming up. <laughs> um, yeah, I think we've got a good idea. Um, so one thing you, you, you talked about was it being seamless. Um, yes. It has to flow. It has to be invisible. That's what makes a good edit. Um, other things about edit, um, not to do with story or, or pacing and rhythm. Um, anyone who's studied music, musicians, are generally good editors, I've noticed. So if you, if you learned to play an instrument when you were a kid, you'll have some rhythm in you. Another thing that's really important is that um, you don't have any technical problems in it. So you don't add any, and you deal with the technical problems that are sent to you by the cameraman. So those are some, some things that make a good edit. I'm just going to show you um, this, and I want you to tell me a few things that you think are wrong with it. Because there are lots of things wrong with it, but it might be, a, it's not... Uh, <laughs> Welcome to 183 Farm, and I am the executive director for our nonprofit farm. I'm Scott Tyson with 183 Farm, and I'm a farmer. Oh. We've done some backyard farming. 
um, had James in our backyard and, and kind of um, started out that way. Um, had, our, had a large garden in our backyard. Three things that we're really uh, trying to accomplish here are teaching, giving, and um, growing food. Carrots actually taste like a real rich carrot. We grow for taste, we don't really grow for uh, show or, or for uh, shipping. So Those crates were going to be thrown away, and we decided to um, salvage them and, and uh, reuse them. Same thing with like the extra fencing that you see there that was going in the trash. So we, we tried to recycle and, and use anything we can um, instead of purchasing it. It goes on. Um, what things do you think were wrong with, with what you just saw? The transitions. The transitions was one of the main things that were wrong with it. Um, it was dreadful. <laughs> In general, that was dreadful. Um, the transitions, anything else? Background noise. Sorry? Background noise is too much background noise. The noise, the noise levels were really, like, especially when it had that kind of spraying thing, it just went <laughs> like that. Horrible. Strange to see somebody not talking while you hear them talking. And looking straight at the camera. Yeah. Really weird. Yeah. And there were two shots that were really too similar. Mm -hmm. And then you cut to her talking and that was almost the same as well. Mm. Dreadful. <laughs> Anything else that was really dreadful about it? Had lots of Wobbly camera. Wobbly camera. Yes. Um, there's not much you can do about... There is something... There are some things you can do about it, but everything that you receive is all wobbly. You just have to use wobbly shots. But yes, there are some things you can do about that. There were chickens everywhere when they weren't talking about chickens, and then when they did talk about the chickens, they had carrots. <laughs> <laughs> Story focused person right here. <laughs> the message seemed to be about organic farming, but they didn't really talk about organic farming. That was kind of a surprise at the end. Yeah. Yeah. It was, yeah, I mean, it was dreadful. Go on, what was you saying? Um, another one thing that really stuck out for me, um, apart from all those things, is, is just the pacing of the cut the edits was terrible there was one shot that was really long and then one that was really quick and then another one that was really long and it just didn't fit or flow that was terrible how about this one i'm just going to show oh it's gone hello computer oh i know why because we're on this let's see what happens when i press the next button i'm just going to show the first bit of this Painful, sorry, just keep watching. <laughs> oh god, I can't stand it. Where's your stuff? It just keeps going like this, basically. Um, so, what was wrong with that? It was wrong in different ways from the last clip. What, what, was, what were some of the things that were wrong with that? The shots were too long, it was incredibly boring. Yes? I find it difficult to read the words, but I could hear someone singing. Yeah, okay, yes. Um, the music, anyone? Excellent. <laughs> I think that was Chinese rock, by the way. But it sounded like Dean Bob. Bad <laughs> angles as well, camera angles. Sometimes you're too far down to be mm -hmm. focusing on what you're supposed to be. I couldn't read the I just, sign that was in the background. Yes, mm -hmm. the sign in the background. It, it was, was in Chinese, huge, that's why. It was a huge sign. Did uh, it say anything? That was, I don't think so. I don't think so. <laughs> well, the shots were dreadful, yes. Um, but the editing, one of the main things about the editing, has anyone no did anyone notice? Did anyone get confused about du oh, the direction the train was moving in? Yeah. Is this 180 yeah. It is, oh, yeah. So what happened was there was one shot of the train going this way, very long and tedious. And then the next shot showed the train going this way. Where? Where? Where's the train going? <laughs> I didn't know where the train was going. 
Anything else that was what terrible? Was it meant to do that? Was it just going backwards and forwards? That's yes, okay, my, yeah, right, maybe it was. <laughs> but I, I don't know. I have no idea what they were trying to do with that. No. That was an educational, that's, this is an educational piece of media. It's supposed to get you to work out the maths of law, but you lost the message because it moved on. It does go on to cutting to a lecturer talking about something scientific, but um, the music was so not on theme. So talking about theme, that was just so inappropriate for what they're trying to do. The edit was too long, the directions were all wrong, and there was one other thing that I didn't like. The transitions. They did this weird kind of diamond transition. Oh, it was dreadful. Okay, so those two shots are really basically just to tell you what, ba what, what bad editing is, not what good editing is. So let's try, try and avoid those things. And that's it. Off you go. <laughs> let's see what we can do next. No, <laughs> no more. So, before we get into nitty-gritty, let's talk about the keys to success in post-production in general. Don't be lazy. Oh, first of all, first of all, when you do post-production, it really does help that you know about the other stages of production. So, if you have some experience in writing a script and doing some shooting, you're going to be better as an editor and in post-production because you know what goes into it. And it works vice versa as well. I would never use a cameraman who says, I don't like editing because they're not going to be a good cameraman. So all of these things are interlinked. Um, and in, as in every stage of production, you, should, you, you cannot be lazy. It takes a lot of work, a lot of time, and you just have to put it in, I'm afraid. Um, and you've got to sleep in your edit suite. Not really. <laughs> um, do be organised. Organisation is the key to post-production. And I'm going to teach you or, or suggest some ways that um, will help you with organisation. Um, focus on details. An editor is anyone involved in post-production. Edit assist, anyone, is um, always going to be very detail-focused. But at the same time, you can see the big picture, which is the story. You can look at one little tiny edit and you can see the whole thing um, as well. The trees and the forest. And of course, keep it simple. That's always a good mantra to have. Now, um, some of you will probably remember this from my last, um, my last workshop. It, it's just um, a good way of, of, of saying that story comes first. Um, content's important, quality's important, but story is the overall god of it all. And content and quality serve the story. Um, I just like that picture. <laughs> so, um, as story is supreme... Um, I'm going to start with storytelling and talk a bit about storytelling in the edit. Um, but where does the storytelling happen in post-production? Hasn't the story already been dealt with in the script and in the shooting? No, it hasn't. Because, as far as I'm concerned anyway, the editor is a supreme storyteller in when you make a film or maybe make a video. Because, at the very least, they have the final say. So, yeah, the editor is the uh, ultimate storyteller. Here we are. Here's your editor. This guy is uh, Victor Nicholas. don't know who he is, but anyway, good picture. You might think, whoa, wait a minute, why have I got a picture for sculptors? We're talking about editing. Well, editing is often likened to sculpting. Um, it's an interesting analogy um, because what you have is, you know, five hours or a hundred hours of footage, and what you have to do is whittle away at the footage till you find your film within, just like a sculptor whittles away at a piece of wood to find a statue within. So, yes, in some ways, editing is, uh, is like sculpting, um, especially at the beginning of your edit, but I would argue that um, editing is like every other art form, um, just like film includes <coughs> every art form. This is my argument, and you can argue with me if you want about that later on. Um, however... Unlike other art forms, editing, as we've already discussed, is invisible. It's unseen. Its aim is to be unseen. You should not be aware of an edit. Um, and because of that, um, it's often ignored. Editing is not considered an art form. At least um, most people ignore it anyway. Um, of course, there is, there is an Oscar for editing. There are awards for editing. But in general, it's like you're not an important person, but actually you are. Um, and people think it's boring. People think editing is boring because it's sitting in front of your computer for hours and hours and hours. That's true, um, but at the same time, 
your brain processes, the amount of involvement and deep thought that editing requires, um, makes it uh, makes it different. Makes it a different experience. It's, it's actually a fascinating uh, thing to do. It's a great art form. That's what I think. So I've got a little quote at the bottom here. I don't know if you can see it. Um, Francis Ford Coppola said once, I think, the essence of cinema. The essence of cinema is editing. So what do you think that means? Um, basically, it means that without editing, you don't have cinema, which means you don't have film. So if you didn't have editing, which is cutting, cutting up your film, you wouldn't have a film. What you'd have is a recording of an event, which is different from cinema, is different from film. So because you can cut, you can create separate clips and you can sti stick those separate clips together and the order of those clips can, be, can, uh, can change. So you can change in time, you can make changes in time from clip to clip, in perspective, uh, subject matter, um, location. So you can have these changes from clip to clip and suddenly through that process, through a simple cut of a strip of film, as it was in the old days, you have endless possibilities for creativity. You have a language. So that's the language that makes uh, cinema, is, is editing. Ah. And what is editing? Well, I think we all know. Um, it's about cutting your footage up and it's about sticking it back together again. Um, I think we've probably already, already covered that what editing actually is. Um, cutting, deciding when in that point, sticking it together and adding other elements. You don't just use the footage, as we've already discussed, we add the music and the titles and all of those other things. Right, so we've, 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 we've established and you all know that the most important thing about um, what makes a good edit is, is the story. But how do you tell a story in the edit? It's really interesting. Um, there's a lot of things to say about it, but um, obviously you can't make a film about Peru if you've got footage about Wales. Um, you're not going to make something that doesn't exist already. But it is true that if you're, being, if you're given something bad, like wobbly shots or bad footage um, that hasn't, you know, hasn't, doesn't really have much of a story, you can change that into something good. You can't change something bad into something great, but you can make it much, much better in the edit. Um, having said that, don't ever say, we'll fix it in post when you're shooting, because that's the lazy man's mantra. You can't fix everything in post. You can fix some things. Can you see? So... The first thing you've got to do when you're telling your story in your edit is, is work with what you've got. You've got a script, you've got footage, and you should know your script, uh, but don't stick to it. Because the script is not the reality that's sitting in front of you. You've got to be led by the content, which is the reality sitting in front of you, the footage that you actually have. So if your script and your footage don't match at all, what are you going to do? change the script, <laughs> you've got to redo the story, basically, in the edit, unless you go and reshoot it. Um, never lose sight of the purpose of your video. We've already discussed that. So the purpose should be set out. Put it on the side. Ah, the coffee. Told you it's coming. <laughs> um, it should be set out in your script. Right at the beginning, before you even write your script, you've got a purpose in mind. You know what you're trying to do. And... Um, Hopefully, you've got the tools, you've got the materials to make that happen in your edit. And then I've put at the end here, kill your baby. Does anyone know what that means? I thought everyone knew what that means. No. Right, okay, so killing your baby basically means... Um, who said it? Someone said it about not getting distracted by... Um, not going off in tangents. Um, yeah, it, it is about storytelling. Basically, you don't get seduced by your footage. You don't get distracted and go off um, and, say, and tell different stories, go off in different angles. And if you've got a beautiful shot of a sunrise that, that you, know, you had to travel up a mountain and it took all day to get, if it doesn't help tell the story, cut it, because it's not going to work. That's what killing your baby is, is getting rid of the things that you love 
to tell the story. Kill your babies. Mm. <laughs> Filmmaker's mantra. <laughs> and the next thing you have to do, obviously, is tell the story. What does that mean, though? <laughs> now, if everyone says, oh, you tell a story, you need a beginning, a middle, and an end. It's kind of like a truism. Um, but it's actually really helpful to think in this way. A beginning, a middle, and an end. What does that mean? Well, a story is a process. It's something that happens. It's an event. And so it needs a beginning. It needs to start. And then it needs to happen. And then it needs to conclude. It needs to wrap up. So all of those things should be included um, in your story and in your edit. Um, it's very helpful when you're editing to th think in terms of sequences, scenes and connections. So a sequence, if you've got a long film, you're going to have several sequences of little things that happen. For instance, someone walks down a corridor and comes in a door. That's a sequence. You're not going to do that in one shot, unless you really wanted to. You'd probably do it in a sequence of about three shots. Him walking down, hand on door, doors open. Small sequence. Then that goes together in a scene, which is a, a collection of, of sequences that go together into a, a bigger event that happens. And then you've got to connect the different events um, in your film. And a lot of films, even short, short videos, work in the same way as a play would work. They've got, um, they've got acts, three acts, beginning, middle, end, right? That's how lots of things work, even when you've only got three minutes. Don't show everything. Cut out the irrelevant stuff. <laughs> You've got 100 hours of footage, or you've got five hours of footage, you need to turn it into five minutes, or you need to turn it into half an hour. How do you do that? You select the things that are going to tell your story, and you cannot show everything. You've got to imply some things. So, um, I'm boiling an egg. The first thing I show is taking the egg out of the box, but I'm not going to show you carrying the egg over to the stove. The next shot is you at the stove putting it in the pot. I'm implying things that happen that you don't need to see. Um, every single cut should advance your story. That's, that's, that's very important. That's how you get rid of the irrelevant stuff that you don't have to show. Everything shows an advancement in a story. And um, at the level of video and educational media, we don't really have to think about the aesthetics of a story. But it is very important when you tell your story. Consider your aesthetics. Things like pacing, music, colour and genre. All of these things do come together um, when, when, uh, when you're telling a story. For instance, the colour of a scene is going to give you a different, a different feeling if it's cold or warm. Um, yeah. Right, so you know, how, you, you know that you have to tell a story. You know you have to have a beginning, a middle and an end. Um, first thing you need to do is grab their attention. When you've got a video or a film, anything of any length, you've got about 10 seconds to say to people, watch me! Because people have really short attention spans, even when they're sitting down for a film. 10 seconds, I'd say, you know. Um, so how do you, how do you grab people's attention? Music is one that, that a lot of people Mm -hmm. um, music, people love music. Yeah. How will you grab attention at the beginning of a video? Shock. What's that? Shock. Shock. You could. You could show, like, the main thing that happens in your film. Yeah. Someone falls down dead Same or something. Yes, shock is a really good one. Mm -hmm. A mystery of some kind. Mystery. You can ask questions. A good way of asking questions is to show a close-up. You start with a close-up. Because um, if you show me my hands writing something or my hand m getting the egg out of, the, out of the, the box, the egg box, you start thinking, what, what are they doing? Why are they taking an egg out of the box? Well, actually, they, you wouldn't probably think that, but bad example. But you know what I mean. Using a close-up is a good way of um, um, asking a question, setting up a mystery. Any other ideas? I'm, I'm just a bit confused here because I'm perhaps wrongly thinking along the lines of a script or a storyboard and thinking about books. Books don't necessarily grab you in the first chapter. Um, so 
am I at the wrong alley somewhere? Yeah. Unless you're really, really good, uh, a really good filmmaker, well, you really, no, you do have to ta attach, um, grab people's attention, even really good filmmakers. If you think about the beginnings of most films, a lot of them start with just a five-minute kind of short introduction that makes people interested in the story and keep on watching. And in videos, it's, it's shorter than that. It has to be shorter than that. So, I mean, I'm just talking about things like you'd start with some nice music or even just a beautiful scene, a beautiful picture, to make people, to persuade people that this is something that's worth watching. It's just with educational media that <coughs> imagine something intriguing, something to draw you in. I'm thinking, how the hell did you do that? <laughs> well, <laughs> take the picture of the train, take the um, example of the train. Although it's badly edited and terrible, they did start with a train instead of a talking head. So their question, what they were trying to teach is how that train worked. So at least they showed the train. Do you know what I mean? Mm -hmm. So a lot of this might be high-minded, but you can turn it into a practical, um, into, into, into a practical solution. Is it a bit like showing a tiny little bit of the end at the beginning, yep. and then you say, the story tells you how you get there? Yep. Is it that, yeah, yeah, that would work, that would work. Um, and if you're making a piece of educational media, you know, maybe, um, maybe you can just do a little tiny introduction of the, the juicy bits, the fun bits. Like, if you're doing an experiment, uh, the introduction to the video is um, them pouring, pouring the, uh, the emulsion in and it exploding. I don't know anything about chemistry. But anyway, something like that. Um, so when you've grabbed their attention, you've got to keep it for the rest of the journey, if you can, <laughs> um, by using pretty pictures, by using engaging w w pictures and words and, and sounds. So if you are just, if you do just have a talking head and that's, your, um, and that's your video, at least make the words engaging, interesting, not too long. Do you know what I mean? And if possible, add some pictures in there. Use variety. A talking head going blah, 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 it, it is a, a, a bit boring. Um, do what you can to, to make it a bit more interesting. Put the slides on there, if, if, if possible. And um, yeah, make sure, make sure you use as many elements as, as you can, the visuals, the words, um, the music, if you can. Um, when I, I, I write here, show, don't tell, um, we all know the truism that a picture tells a thousand words. It's quicker if you show something rather than trying to describe it. And if you've got pictures and words working together, um, you don't need to say it. You just show it. That's what I mean by that. And keep it short uh, and as simple as possible. Um, this is, um, I mean, maybe a lot of you won't be working with, with this, but this is one way of, of introducing variety into, into a video, is by using your different camera, camera angles. Um, and camera angles just means basically the size of what you're shooting. So this is, this is a wide. Um, and a wide would be used to introduce your story. So this is about using a story, how to tell a story in an edit. You use the different camera angles to say different things. So a wide introduces, a medium shows the action, and a close-up uh, shows detail. Um, a simple way of, uh, if you're filming an event or, um, or an action, an experiment, a simple way of, uh, of, of, of bringing in variety with your shots. Um, right. So, um, as we were discussing, we need to make the edit invisible. But how do you make the edit invisible? How do you make it flow? This is the aim of making it visible. It has to flow. Nothing must jar or the ear or the eye. The eye or the ear. Um, one thing you mustn't do is have a jump cut. It just looks dreadful. Now, what is a jump cut? Does anyone know what a jump cut is? It's what we saw in the first video. Mm. Yes, it is, because they had, lot, they had these several shots that looked very similar, but actually weren't cut together. And so if you've got one shot, and you cut out the middle, and you put those, the two ends together, 
then what happens is the person's talking and then suddenly it goes and starts talking again. So it jumps and makes people very uneasy and it's just, it's just, it looks really bad and you don't want that kind of quality in your, um, in, in your piece of educational media, if possible. And so the jump, what, what they did in the first video is they broke the 30 degree rule. And so um, the 30 degree rule is, is the rule where you, you, you're trying to make some degree of difference between your shots, at least 30 degrees in angle. Um, and so you can make a difference between your shot by making it closer or further away. Um, but that's just a reminder to yourself to make your shots as different as possible and to use shots that are different in your edit. Um, another way of, of, of making sure that the edit flows is to cut on the action. Um, so you might not think that you're going to be using that idea, but you, you, you use it in the most simple of, of cuts. I've got a wide of me walking down the corridor, and I want to walk into a door. Do I walk into a door or open a door? I want to open a door, <laughs> and I'm walking, 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 and then the next cut shows me with my, handle, with my hand on the door handle, opening it. Um, I need to show that process, so I cut just when my hand is um, coming to the door handle, and then I've got the close-up of my hand. If I cut from here, and suddenly I'm here, that's going to jump. I cut here, just where the, um, just where the action happens. So that, what, that is what cutting on the action means. It's really actually um, a, a simple uh, thing. Uh, timing is, is obviously very important in an edit. That's how you make it flow. But it's, in, it's so intuitive, it's, it's really hard to teach you timing. You just have to know it. And that's why I say that rhythm, as a musician, you'll have learnt it um, from that. And um, don't forget your audio. As, as Mary said, um, audio is a very, very important part of any film or any video. And the aim with your audio edit is different from your picture edit because the pictures will change, and it's really obvious, it should be at least obvious, where um, that this shot is, is different from this shot, even though you accept it in your eyes. Um, but the audio cannot, cannot be like that. It cannot be an obvious change from one audio scape to another audio scape. <clears throat> it needs to be a seamless flow, the whole thing. So how do you make that happen when you do have cuts between the audio? Um, well, the first thing that works is to cut on silence, to cut on a quiet bit. So if you've got someone speaking, um, you've got a voice and you want to cut between two sentences, you cut where they're not speaking. If it doesn't work, if you're hearing a kind of sound or a jump in the edit, in, in, in that sound, you can put a smooth transition, a smoothing transition between those two cuts. And Matt will show you how to do that. And that often smooths over, um, smooths over the cuts so you don't hear it. You're not supposed to hear any cuts in audio. The other thing you could do, if it doesn't work where the picture is cut, you could cut the audio in a different place. So maybe it works a few frames down the line, or maybe it works a few frames back. Um, and uh, the other thing you could do, I've suddenly forgotten what it is. Um, oh yes, if you're bringing in um, a different element of sound. For instance, you've got one sound which is in a, one shot which is in a quiet room, and the next shot is out on the street where it's noisy with all the cars. You don't cut straight away to that sound. You bring the sound in slowly, so it it kind of raises up slowly while the other clip is playing. And then when that cut, the new clip comes in, you're already used to that sound. So those are a few things you can do to make that smooth edit in the sound. And Matt will show you, a few, uh, uh, show you how to do a few of those things uh, in practical terms. Um, a, a few more rules to just to keep in your head. Um, the 180 degree rule, um, a, lot, a lot of these rules are to do with using the 2D space that you have. So what you're doing is you're translating the 3D world that we live in into a 2D space, into a, into a plane. And you need to know that there are rules to how that works, and there are rules to do with position and direction. So the train, they broke that rule, and it looked rubbish. <laughs> they broke the 180 degree rule. So what you do when you're filming, you've got a line, and so I've got two people here, 
talking to each other across the desks. If I shoot her, I'm going to shoot her that way, and then I shoot the other, the other guy this way. If I went round to the other side, the direction of these two people, the position of them would swap around, confusing the direction. So you've got to, be a, you've got to remember, not just when you're shooting, but when you're editing, that you, don't want, you want them to be on the same side of the screen the whole way through, left and right. Um, Eyeline match is also, um, is, also, is also to do with the, 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 the spatial 2D space that you're working in. So if, if you've got a character looking at something, if you've got a scientist in our experiment looking at the experiment, what are you going to do next? What's your next cut going to be? What the scientist is looking at. So that's what eyeline match means. Oh, someone looking at something. Oh, what they're looking at. Um, that's just a, a good way of, of, of making your space wider than the screen that it, um, it actually is in. Um, and, and then there's continuity. Now, that's a rule to do. Um, I like matches to do with, with continuity. Continuity is to do with what? What does that mean, continuity? Not appearing with a hat in one clip and then not, not having a hat the next. Basically, yeah, it's the hat thing. It's the hat rule. Actually, they call it the hat rule. Um, if you uh, have in your if you have in your boiling of the egg video, one in one shot the egg is white and the next shot the egg is brown. That's a continue. That's a problem with continuity. Why would that happen? Oh, because you shot it on different days because you you know got it wrong or something like that. Um, but you want to make sure that every, every element in the edit is, is, works together and there aren't any mistakes that make you go, wait a minute, that's not right. So, a few more aesthetic, aesthetic tips. Um, just to, really simple aesthetic tips to make your edit better. Um, I, I would say never use transitions between shots. Um, and transition is when like, you've got two shots together and then you put a fade over them so one fades into the other, like that. That's transition between the shots. Um, if you need to put transition between two shots, it means that you're not doing a job well. You have not made the edit work. So what you need is a clean, shot from one to, a clean cut from one shot to the next. That's um, why you should avoid using transitions because... Um, however, having said that, the only place that you will use transitions is, when, is at the beginning and the end. So you will come from a black screen and go to the picture. You don't want that to be immediate because that jars. So you put on a slow change to make it come from black, go to picture. That's the only time you use transition, as far as I'm concerned. Um, another thing is don't cut too fast. Um, if possible, let your... your your footage breathe. You don't need to make things fast to make them interesting. Uh, you just you need to tell a story to make it interesting. So don't worry about cutting fast to make it cool. You don't need to do that. Um, if you're using titles, make them really clean and simple. Use a really simple font like Arial and just choose white or black. Don't, don't try and go overboard with your titles or your graphics. Don't make them bright green. Um, just my opinion. <laughs> um, avoid using still images. You often have to use still images because you haven't got anything else. Or your video is about still images. Who watched that video? Okay, that's good. <laughs> that was about still images, so it had to use still images. But what did they do to those still images? Zooming in out, panning mm -hmm. across. It made them move, yeah. yeah. Because this is the movies. You need to make things move, right? So... How does that work then, Lizzie, with things like, you know, if you do an educational video and you're showing a PowerPoint or something, with a, you know... <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Yes. Um, how good's your PowerPoint? <laughs> yes, just use Prezi, no. Um, I would say you've got movement in your head with the words then. Slightly getting off the point, but you don't make a PowerPoint move. That would look weird. But if you're using a picture or a photo, you do make it move. Yeah. yeah. Um, and if you've got, uh, if you have footage that you're using rather than a PowerPoint, um, you can use the mistakes 
in the shooting creatively. Um, that's, that's a fun thing to do. So, here we go. We, we're, we're powering through it. I had this on uh, my last uh, presentation as well. It just gives you an idea of how long, things, how long things take. Basically a long time. You don't know how long things take until you actually do it. Um, filming takes up the least amount of time. It should, at least. And really, you're going to be spending a long time doing post-production. So these proportions, and in general, are the correct proportions. And just have it in your mind that it's going to take a long time to edit your film. The more footage you have, the longer it takes. <laughs> right. Um, in your packs, you've got a step-by-step, -step, um, kind of like a checklist for post-production. Um, I put these together for all the stages of production because I thought it might be quite useful to have all these steps in mind when you're doing something. You obviously don't have to do everything. It's just an idea of, some of, of most of the things that, you, um, that might happen. Um, so I'm just going to go through some of the, the steps now. Um, first thing you need to do right at the beginning is, as I said, um, organisation, right? You have to get organised. Um, so I'm talking about practicalities now. Stop talking about arty stuff. I'm talking about practicalities now. Um, the first thing that I would do if I had a project is set up a project folder on my computer. Um, this is what my project folder would, would look like, vaguely like this. You all have one of these project folders on your computer and you're going to use it when we go through the trainings. Um, and in my project folder I would have a space for all of these things. Obviously your footage goes in there. The graphics means things like your logos. Um, if you're making something for, for Glyndur University, you'd probably put the logo on it. So you need somewhere just to keep it tidy. It's all about keeping it tidy at the beginning and the whole way through. Images would be any picture you have to use in your edit. <laughs> uh, music and sound, if you're, if you're that way inclined. By the way, if you're going to use music, it takes a long, long time. So if you have an extra few days or an extra day, Spend that day finding music. <laughs> if you don't, forget about music. This is outputs. This is the stuff, this is your edit. So you're editing away and you think, I've got a good rough cut now and I want to show it to someone. So you'd put it in your rough cuts. You'd export something and you'd put it in your rough cuts. And that's where you'd keep the finished video. Then you've got a folder here for Premiere, if you're using Premiere. If you're using ReVideo, re you don't need this. Um, Premiere, when you open a project in Premiere, it creates a, a file. Um, and that file uh, has to live somewhere. And if you put it in that, a folder, then what's going to happen is all the other files that Premiere creates, it creates lots of files, just because it likes messing with your computer. It, it creates autosave and preview files. And it will all be kept, by default, it will be kept in the same folder, in the same position as your project file. Um, so that's a useful thing to, to have. And then you've got a little folder here for your production documents, which, which is your script and any record that you're keeping, anything, any paperwork. That's a useful thing to have. You want to keep it all together. So this is keeping everything together. Um, and it's a, good way, it's a good way to work. So when you've set that up on your computer, that folder, you can start taking care of your footage. <coughs> um, this is really designed for people who, ha who have a lot of footage or are making a lot of videos. Um, usually, you know, and even if you're making just a simple voiceover um, for, for, a, for a slide, you might be shooting over, so you might be recording that voice one day and then you edit it and you think, this is rubbish, I'm going to do it another one. I'm going to do another try at it. So create a new folder for each batch of footage or whatever it is you're creating, filming or recording. And I would label it with a date and a brief description of the content. So here's the date, um, and here's the content, the veg box. Um, the reason I date things like this with the year at the front is because it really helps with chronology. Um, the computer's going to list it from oldest to newest on your computer. It's a, it's a good way of, um, of organising your folders. don't know if anyone else finds that. Then what you do is you've got your camera. Finally, you can get the footage off your camera and um, put it on your computer. Our advice is that you copy the entire file structure from your camera's recording meter, which is your card, to the computer. 
So you don't just go in and find the clips and copy them over, but you just take the whole thing and plonk it into that folder. Now, the reason we say that is because um, it's OK when you're using Premiere or using Wii Video, but some people use Final Cut. Some people use other editing software. And some editing software, like Final Cut Pro 7, has a really big problem dealing with files, dealing with uh, footage if it hasn't got all the little files, the other files that come along. So it's just, it's just a safety uh, net if you, follow, if you copy everything over, and it doesn't cost you anything, and it's easier. So copy everything over, then make sure everything's copied correctly. Um, you do that by comparing the size of the folders, one on your computer, one on your card, they're pretty much the same. They've got the same number of files. You've got, it, you've got it right. Try playing some of the files on your computer. Does it work? Got them all. You've got all your footage. You don't want to lose your footage, right? And then what I would say, if, if possible, is back it up. You don't want to lose it, you see? Put it onto another hard drive. <laughs> Maybe a lot of people won't be doing that. Um, but it is a good pra it's good practice, so I've got to tell you guys. And then, um, then you can go ahead and delete the footage from your memory card, from your camera. And every time you copy a batch of footage onto your computer and back it up, you go, you go ahead and delete it off your camera. Because in that way, the next time you bring in footage, it's all going to be new footage. And the best way to delete off your camera is to format the card. And um, you can talk to us about that. <laughs> It'll tell you. Uh, right. This is... This is um, this is a, a shot of Premiere, and Matt will go through the details of these things, but I just wanted to just introduce you to what, um, what it looks like. Obviously, an editing software is software that allows you to bring all your footage in, put it together, and export a file. You all um, know that. But um, it, it might look really complicated, but actually, this is pretty much the same as, as Premiere. They all work in, in, in the same way. Um, all of them will have this, uh, you can see it's, it's got little, it's got sections, it's got windows. Um, and all, all editing software will have this kind of project window here. Now, you probably can't see it clearly because of the screen, but the project window, you'll see it later, is where you keep all your stuff. That's where you keep all your footage. You bring the footage in and you put it here. And it's not just your footage, it's everything else, like your music and your images and any titles that you create will go here. And Wii Video has the same thing. Um, then what you've got in Premiere, but not in Wii Video, because in Wii Video, these two are combined. This is a monitor. And this is the monitor that views things from here. So if you clip on a clip, click on a clip in here, you'll see it here, which is your source monitor. Then what you've got is your sequence. This is um, obviously where you're doing your editing. I um, just want to say a little bit about, about uh, how a sequence works, because Matt's going to be talking about the practicalities of cutting and things like that. A sequence is linear, just like a piece of film. It starts at the beginning and it ends at the end, so it's running along that way. Um, this is a clip on a sequence, and the length of the clip is how long it plays for. Um, now, you can, you can change the size of the sequence. You can zoom in, you can zoom out. So the clip, it looks like it's a different length, but the actual playtime doesn't change. And the proportion of the clips, that one's a short one, that one's a long one, doesn't change either. Um, now, a sequence works on, on the two, two sides of it. There's a bottom and a top. Bottom and top. Top and a bottom. On the top, you've got your pictures. You've got your visuals. There's a line separating it. You'll see very clearly when you get into Premiere. Um, so the picture, and on the bottom here, you've got your sounds. You've got your audio. So that's the basic way it works. And it works in levels. So you can have lots of different tracks. In the visuals, on the picture side of it, if you put um, a picture on a, on a higher track, you won't see what's below. Unless it's a title, because the title doesn't have a background usually, unless you add one. So I've got a title here, and that's that clip there, and I can see the picture below as well. On the audio side of things, it works differently. You've got layers as well, but it mixes the sounds together. You can still... S I can still hear this track when this track comes in. So that's what mixing audio is all about. 
Um, it's about putting all the different types of sounds together. So that's how a sequence works, if you didn't know. Um, so what's this then? Well, this is what's happening on your sequence. This is where you view your sequence. It's called the program monitor. So these are the basic windows or panels in an editing software, any editing software. And obviously, you can see there are lots of other bits and bobs all over the place, like this, which is your tools, and this, which is where you see your audio going up and down. Um, but um, the basic setup is just like this. Now, you can see here that I've got lots of folders um, in my project panel. That's because I'm really organized. Um, and it's really important to not just be organized on your computer, but also when you're editing. And uh, I'm going to just show you this quickly. And you can go on and, and look at it in your own time. But these are my recommended project, um, folder setups for WeVideo, which is slightly different from Premiere. Uh, it does different things, so you need different folders. For, my, for WeVideo and for Premiere, I would suggest you, you set it up in that way. And as you go through the edit, you put, for instance, you put your footage in your footage folder. You keep it tidy, and then you can find things. It just really makes things so much easier if you use these folders. They're called bins in Premiere. If you use these bins or folders and you put everything in the right folder, then you know where it is. It's really much a tidier way to work. Right, this thing keeps coming up on my screen. Um, <laughs> so, some base, just like um, any artist, um, an editor is, is not just an artist. It, he or she is also a technician. You need to know technical things. And these are really, really basic technical things that you need to know to not make mistakes and make your edit look really, really silly. So it looks complicated, but it really, it, it really isn't. Um, <clears throat> so aspect ratio and frame size um, work together. Now, the frame size is basically how big your frame is. OK? So a standard frame size is written like this often. This is HD, high definition. Um, it's written like this because this, is, this refers to pixels. Now, the pixels are the little dots that make up a picture on um, a digital picture. And if you look really close, you can actually see the dots. They're square dots, normally. Um, and these numbers, to refer to how many there are on, an, on a high definition screen. So there's 1,920 little dots going the long way, that way, and there's 1,080 going down this way. And that makes a ratio that, um, hmm? <laughs> and that makes a ratio which turns into your aspect ratio, which is the shape of your screen. So that divides perfectly into 16 by 9. So we say 16 by 9 is like that, okay? Well, <laughs> So you need, to know, you need to know this, because if you don't know it, what happens is this. Can everyone see that that is, a distor that is distorted? What do you think has happened to this picture? This is Paul McCartney, by the way. It's been squeezed. What he's, what he's done for some weird reason, I can't work out, is this guy has taken a 16 by 9 a widescreen picture, the ones that we're all going to be working with, with the equipment that we have, and he's turned it into a 4 by 3 frame size. And it's distorted. Avoid this by all means. Avoid distortion by all means. And also, avoid these horrible black edges. Look at the clocks. I've always a telltale, cost, time, a telltale song circles if the clocks look squeezed up. Mm. Or if any certain picture is squeezed. Yeah, nicely. but beware of perspective, of course. True. Yeah. Anyway, that is what happens if you get your frame size or your aspect ratio wrong. Another thing you need to know when you get to exporting is that you're filming at a particular frame rate. Now, the frame rate is um, how many pictures are taken per second to make the video happen. So what happens, um, you, know, you know how a cartoon works. One picture, another picture, another picture. Put it together and it looks, like it's hap it looks like something's happening. Same with video, same with film. And um, in, vid in video, 
what normally happens is you're taking 25 little pictures um, every second. So that's what the 25 refers to. Um, and it's diff there, are, there are lots of different frame rates, it's not just 25. So you need to know that actually normally what's standard in high definition, the equipment that you're using is 25 frames per second. What's the P stand for? It doesn't stand for per. It's, it stands for progressive. That's not going to work. No, no batteries. Ah. That works. Um, P stands for. Um, can you get the Duracell one? Still work better. Um, P stands for progressive. Now, progressive. I don't know why it's called this, but progressive basically means one picture. Excuse us, technical difficulties. Got it? Um, one picture, and, and that's um, how, how videos recorded these days. In the old days, when um, things weren't so fast and they weren't so cool, it was recorded in interlaced, which is an eye. And that means there's two pictures taken together and they're, they're slotted together like that to make one. Um, so it's two pictures, half pictures, really. That's what interlaced is. And nowadays, they have the capacity to take one picture. So it's much better quality. So if you're exporting, you see, oh, I've got another frame right here, which is 50. That must be better. 50 with an I at the end. I don't know what that means. And then you export your video at 50i, it's going to be wrong. So just stick to 25p, because that's what you're shooting at. Another technical thing you should know is two channels of sound. There's so many times that um, I've seen a video and there's only one channel of sound and it's only coming into my left ear. Yeah. I listen to stuff on, on headphones. You should always listen to stuff on headphones when you're editing so that you know about that, where the sound's coming from. Um, what we aim for in video is to have two channels of sound, one for your left ear and one for your right ear, and they sound the same. It's not stereo, not strictly speaking, it's just, it's actually... One, one track of sound, but two channels. And they need to sound the same, they can't be different. It's just distracting. Um, Which tells you that it, it, it's two-dimensional mono, as opposed to stereo. Yes, it is. It is. Yes. Um, the other thing you need to know about your sound levels is you need to make sure that they don't distort. Basically, keep it below zero dB. If it starts hitting zero dB, which you'll see on your editing software when you get in there, it's going to distort. It's going to break up, and your sound is going to be terrible. Um, and you'll see it on your waveforms as well. What you need is a healthy waveform that goes up and down like that. If you see a waveform that goes like this, <coughs> like that, that's when your sound is too loud, and it's breaking up and distorting. You've gone beyond the pale. I'm just going to let, let you listen to some sound that's too loud and starts to distort and see um, if you can hear it. I wonder where it is. Oh, hmm. Actually, harder, to think, harder than I thought it would be to hear that. The sound. Um, that's distorted goes oom, 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 like that. It, it just completely loses its natural um, sound. So you've just got to be careful of that because there's so many videos I've seen with distorted, terrible uh, uh, sound. Right. I'm going over already. Um, what's the time, guys? Right. Um, this is what you do at the start of your editing process. You've brought your footage in, you're all organised, you're ready to start. What you need to do first is watch all your footage. You need to know your footage. Watch it and log it. Now, logging means basically writing it down. But it means basically knowing it, knowing where things are. In, when I first started out, I wrote everything down. When I was watching my footage, I'd write out what happened. <laughs> um, now I don't do that anymore, but the, the concept still holds. You need to know what's there so that you can edit it. 
Then you start structuring your story. As most of us will be working with words, with a narrative, with interviews, you start by cutting down the voiceover in the interview until you've got... You use that as the bones of your structure. So um, it's very simple, really. Cut down what, does, uh, what do you want, cut it down, and then what you do is you start adding pictures over that. That's um, an, an, an easy way to edit. If you're doing um, anything vaguely documentary-like, I would say that in Premiere and in WeVideo, um, to help you along, you should save your work in stages by creating new sequences. And Matt will show you how to do that. So your first sequence, which is the timeline I was telling you about, is, your, is all the footage. And then you start choosing bits that you like, or, or voiceover that you like, or interview bits that you like. Then you, then you copy that sequence into a new sequence and you keep going. It's a really good way of... of watching the stages of your work and, and, um, and saving what you've done. And you can go back at any time to all your raw footage and, 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 um, and find stuff that you need again. Um, yeah, so you've, once you've got the, uh, bare, the bare bones, the voice or the interview or whatever it is that's the bare bones of your story, you can start building it up by adding, adding, adding pictures on the top. Um, and don't forget to save, save your project. It, or they will save it for you. We video and Premiere will save it for you, but you know it's like half an hour between a saving or something like that, and you don't want to do lots of changes, and then the, the computer crashes and you've lost everything just before an auto save. Um, in the middle, you just you, you keep editing, obviously, you keep building it up, you put more layers on your sequence, and in the middle is where you start making it flow. So you've built up a structure at the beginning. And now you want to make it flow, make sure that each cut kind of works and it doesn't go Ooh, like that in your eyes or your ears. Um, ask for pickups to fill gaps. What does that mean? Has anyone heard the phrase pickups before? Um, a pickup is, um, is basically extra shooting. So it, it always happens. I build pickups into my workflow. When we make our kit videos, we film the main bit and then after we've edited it, we, are, we film more. Extra little shots that we need to make it all fit together. So as an editor, you can say, wait a minute, you missed out that very important shot of, um, of the stove being turned on when I'm boiling my egg. I need that shot, go and get it. And just make sure that there's no continuity error. They're wearing the same clothes, for instance. Um, so that's a pickup. And then in the middle, you're reviewing, 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 and re-editing. So anything you do, if it's got cuts in it, you watch it, see if it works. That's what it means. And at the end, you got to the end, we're nearly at the end. <laughs> you get to the end, you've got a nice edit, you think, oh, it looks nice, I'm going to show it to people now. You've got to share it, otherwise you don't know what's happening. What, you, know. you don't know if you've done a good job or not. You get your feedback and you re-edit again if necessary. You tidy it up, you tighten it up, you fix any problems. And by fixing problems, I mean things like a wobbly shot. There are things you can do, but... It's slightly involved. Um, uh, one thing you can do is, shoot a, is, is fix a wonky shot. That's really easy. So you've got a shot of a nice scene, but it's like that. The horizon goes like that. You can very easily fix that, straighten it up. And Matt will show you where you can do that in both, um, both editing softwares. And once you've finished your edit, you will add your titles and your music. You could start with music at the be beginning, but you could add it at the end. Um, it's, it's important to add titles at the end because otherwise you don't know where they're going to go, you know? And then you mix your audio. So mixing the audio, remember when I said in the sequence, you've got all these different levels, uh, different layers of audio, and they all kind of, you can hear them all together. You've got to make sure that there's no one layer that's too loud. So if you've got a voice and you want to put music underneath it, you need to make sure that you can hear the voice um, and that the music is quietly underneath. You can still hear it, but it doesn't interfere with the voice. That's all that mixing uh, means. Making sure that nothing is too loud and nothing is too quiet. That's what you do at the end, before you export. Now, exporting, in Wii Video they call it publishing. It's the same thing. It's basically taking all the edits that you've done and turning it into one single file that you take out of the editing software and put somewhere else. 
So it's an independent file. That's all exporting means. Now, when I say here at the bottom, consider where you've come from and where you're going. Those are the two important things to do when you're exporting. That's why you need some technical knowledge. You need to know your frame size um, and your frame rate because you don't want to get that wrong when you export it. If you're shooting in high definition and you've got a frame rate of 1080 by 19, 1920, then export at that size as well, if possible. And um, also, where are you going? Where's, where are you going to put your video? Are you going to go and put it on YouTube? Are you going to put it on Vimeo? What are you going to do with it? If you know that, it's much easier to know what you should do when you export. And Matt will take you through some of that. Once you've got a file, what you're going to do is, um, is distribute it. This is a very, very long, drawn-out process. It could be. As long as your video is in existence, you can be distributing it. Um, the basic thing to do, I guess, in this day and age, is put it on YouTube, isn't it? But you don't just put it on YouTube and forget about it. Um, you make it, you use it, you make it work for you, you advertise it, you share it with the people you know, say, hey look, I've got this video up here, um, you advertise it, um, you respond to the comments, if anyone's leaving you comments, as long as they're not rude, offensive comments, those you just ignore, um, respond to the comments to show that you're an active part of this community, this online video community, and then think of other places to uh, distribute your video, like, like where, where else would you put a video, not just YouTube. Well, we're going to Blackboard, I think. Yep, it should. And yes. yes. on our learning portal. Yes, on our learning portal. Yay! That one. But, but if, I mean, if it's you're designing your video to use as a learning object, it needs to go with all the other learning materials. It needs to be a part of a course. So yeah, um, Vimeo. There are other online platforms as well. And don't forget that you can always show your video at events. You know, that's when you've got a captive audience; they can't get away. So there's lots of different ways to use your video. Now, I'm just going to um, talk about these really quickly because we run out of time. Whoops. Um, about openness. These are important things, but I always get to it right at the end of the presentation and I haven't got any time. Um, making it open means making sure that other people can use your stuff. It's about sharing your knowledge and your learning and your creativity. And if you don't know about Creative Commons, um, I'd say looking into it would be a really good idea. Both YouTube and Vimeo allow you to add Creative Commons licenses, by the way, so if you ever wanted to do it that way, you can. It works two ways. If you make your stuff open, you can use stuff that other people have made. Pictures, video footage, music, anything. You can use it if it's been released with a Creative Commons license. And these are some of the places that you can go to find this stuff. If you want to know how to find it, every single place is a bit different and everything comes with a caveat. You have to be careful of all of these places that you go to find stuff. If you want to know, then book us on a parachute session and we'll show you. <laughs> um, I would say just be careful if you're going to do this. If you're going to go out into the wider internet world and find stuff to use, to use in your own project, just be careful. Just make sure that you are using something that the author or the creator has created himself or herself. And, and usually it's obvious, you, you don't want to use some stolen piece of, um, some, some, some stolen picture. Um, make sure it's released under a Creative Commons license. That is easy, an easy way of doing it. And Can the I best one is, sorry? Lizzie, can I just add? Yeah. So I understand there's been some slight changes to the copyright CLA license. Yes. If, if material is copyrighted, you can now use it for educational purposes within the classroom, Yes. but there's some vagueness about whether you can then put that online. There is vagueness. It is a vague issue. So sticking to Creative Commons, and if everyone used Creative Commons would make it slightly easier, but yes, there has been a change to the copyright legislation, um, which um, avails me to the last thing I'm going to show you. <laughs> um, just to continue with this, um, this is the easiest license is attribution only, which means all you have to do is say who it was by, and it just makes your life much easier if you stick to that license. Avoid public domain, it's a, it's a minefield of, of copyright, and, and be careful of these two places, Internet Archive and Wikimedia Commons, which um, I showed on this picture here, these two guys. It's just because sometimes they have dodgy stuff up there. 
Um, and when you use found materials, you have to credit them. And this is a little bit of information about how to look after it so that crediting is made easier for you. And you can look it into, it, into it in your own time. Ah, this is an example of a picture that I used in one of my edits for Kadan. And this is the credit that I put on it. This is an example of how to credit. Title, author, where I got it from, and the license. All of those things. And it, you'll notice in my presentation that every photo that I've used <coughs> um, has been credited. Every photo that I've used that I haven't created myself is a Creative Commons um, piece of material. Is a Creative Commons material. So that's it, really, guys. Woo! Nearly got through it in time. Um, to wrap up, I just want to say, um, go forth and conquer. <laughs> Um, be creative, think outside the box, but also think inside the box because the box is your screen and that is your world. And everything's about the edit. there. <laughs> Further reading should you be interested. I'll be sending out this presentation um, tomorrow or next week so that you've got it. And it'll be on my website, on our website as well as the material. Fuses, my losers. Any questions, guys, before we have coffee? <laughs> it's a bit overwhelming, actually. There's a normal lot of teaching going on. Yeah. Yeah. There is a lot to do. do. Yeah. There's a lot to try and do. But start, oh. so start with just one cut. <laughs> When you're talking, um, what I think I'd find quite difficult is not having technical knowledge. You know, when you're talking about um, how you, the size of your files mm -hmm. is where they've come from, where they're going to, it's all that sizing it sort of goes over my head. That's right, you know, because yeah. you've got your camera and you've got your bits, but you're not always too sure of all uh, those technical details, which probably come second nature to you. But Well, um, those few rules that I brought up, Let's find them again. Um, oh, there they are. Yeah, those few, few, few rules, basically this one, those numbers and those numbers, you're going to be, sh with the equipment that we supply, we, that we've supplied to mm -hmm. our partner institutions, it's all eight, it's HD. Right, right Russ? Yeah. It's all going to be shooting oh, see, in these so. two numbers. And if you just remember that, mm -hmm. when you come to export, and that will show you, it, just keep it to one choice. There's only one preset. Yes. And there's only one way to set up your project. It's, it's, um, it's very simple if you keep to the presets and you keep to these numbers. Yeah, I think. Does that tend to be the default setting on these things? On Premiere? Yeah. No. Oh, okay. no, need on <laughs> it's, not, it's not default on, on Wii Video. Uh, exporting from Wii Video is really simple. There are only two choices. It's not actually full HD on Wii It's not full HD either, but <laughs> we'll show you the second yeah. best thing. Yeah. <laughs> But it's, you can always scale down if you work at full HD. So yeah, if you, bring, if you bring yeah. things in. You're filming at this size, this many pixels, and if you edit at this many pixels, you're not going to go wrong. And if you need to make it smaller later on, you can. OK, so you go down, but you can't yeah. go up. Well, no, you can't go up. Once Sorry. you've cut it down, it's, it lost, it's lost its quality. No, if you have a smaller st um, number... Yeah. You can't then export to a higher. No, you can't. That's the well, you, 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 can't you can, it. but the num if you if you export this number of pixels out mm. to seven twenty, which is half of it, um, half of this, isn't it? 
Yeah. It's well, smaller, yeah. um, but still 16 by yeah. 9. Yeah. It's still considered kind of HD. Um, you, you've only got that many pixels, and so if you want to blow it up again, you've still got that many pixels, you're just making it look yeah. bigger. Okay. Just making it look oh. bigger. You'll just lose a bit of clarity if you scale up. It'll yeah. just be a bit blurry. But It'll be yeah. blurry because the pixels, you're making yeah, the pixels bigger. Yeah, it's the same as like making a, a, an image bigger. In the way yeah, it's it is yeah. exactly the same. You can do it if you have to, but... Yeah. <laughs> you don't have to. <laughs> <laughs> no. it's not good idea. I went through a lot of stuff there, and things will start to become more clearer when Matt starts to talk to you about practicalities and when you do your own edit. But it's a long, drawn-out process. You know, once you listen to these few things and then you, if you make a video, things will become clearer. That's, that's how learning works, right? So after this workshop, go and make a video. <laughs> Any other questions? No? Brilliant. Let's, let's go and have a drink. Yeah. <laughs>